pick up pretty much where we left off last week. And um, hopefully it won't be a, a long session tonight because we're, we're kind of tying up some loose ends of what we've already taught. Uh, but uh, I want to get into a couple of things. Before we do, though, we'll go ahead and uh, open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together and receive from your word. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. And so, Father, we just open ourselves up to receive from your word tonight. We believe revelation knowledge will flow. We thank you, Father, for perhaps answering questions here tonight through the session and inspire us to reach out and do what you've called us to do here in the earth and to fulfill our mission here. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, get into our topic of genuine Christianity. I had a uh, reminder today <laughs> on Facebook, and like I said, Facebook is not where you want to get your, your doctrine and your theology. <laughs> Bless their hearts, hallelujah. Um, there is a guy, and I won't, I won't name him or identify him, but uh, there is a gentleman who fancies himself an expert in the Word. He actually is a Rhema graduate. You'd think he'd know better <laughs> than a lot of what he says, but uh, he was, he picked up, he, he likes to pick up on things that are intentionally controversial. He wants to stir the pot. And that, from his point of view, I think is his mission, <laughs> is to stir things up. Well, he came out today and said, speaking words, speaking words. Everybody's talking about the power of speaking words. He said, uh, there's too much made of this. And I'm thinking, now, you're a Rhema grad. You grew up listening to Brother Hagen. You know about the importance of words, Hulk to. You know what Mark 11 says. And I mean, we know from, uh, from James chapter 3 that the very cycle or course of nature is set in motion by our tongue. The Word of God says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I mean, there's just verse after verse, example after example of the power of speaking. Well, he starts running down speaking the Word of God. He says, now there's nothing wrong with speaking the Word of God. And there's nothing wrong, you know, but. You can hear the but in the background. Well, I found all that disheartening to a certain extent as a teacher. I was like, you know, <laughs> part of me felt like Foghorn Leghorn. Boy, sit down and shut up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but, you know, I didn't. I'm sitting there reading this little missive there. and Somebody chimes in with a comment. And their comment to me was worse than the guy trying to stir the pot. Because the comment was, yeah, that word of faith bunch, he said, that's why I left the word of faith, is because of all the, uh, the talk about the importance of speaking words. And I thought, that's a dumb reason to leave the teaching of the word of God and what the Bible says. I mean, we know that Romans chapter 10, Paul writing there said, what saith it, the word is neither even... In thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now, Paul said he preached the word of faith. He didn't say he preached Baptist doctrine. <laughs> he didn't say he preached Methodist doctrine. He said he preached the word of faith. <laughs> and, of course, I'm being a little bit facetious because there was no such thing as Baptist or Methodist back in his day. But there were groups that identified themselves by different labels. And uh, when Paul wanted to explain what he preached, he said, we, the people with me, which means to me Barnabas and all the others that traveled with him, we preach the word of faith. And the word of faith is, and he went on to say, that is confession of the mouth, believing in the heart. I mean, that is what he preached. And if you look at his writings, it's all through his writings. And it's all through the New Testament. It's all through the Old Testament. I mean, you could go through Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. But here's a guy that said, yeah, that word of faith bunch, I left them because their emphasis on words. And I'm like, the Bible's the one that gave the emphasis on words. 
God's the one that said that death and life's in the power of the tongue. You know, don't, you're not arguing with me. Now, I know that they could look at my ministry and say, Word of Faith Ministries Incorporated, and they could look at all my various things that I'm doing, like Speak Faith TV and Speak Faith Live video show and Speak Faith broadcast and say, See, you just emphasize speaking faith. Well, yes, <laughs> I do. I'll plead guilty to that. But the thing is, it's because I sat down one day and I said, Lord, just give me in a nutshell what it is I'm to be about. And he said, speaking faith. And so I said, okay, that's what I'm about. That's my kind of mission. That's my vision. And he gave me a little more detailed version of that. Proclaim the word of faith, be a showcase of ministries, train people, fulfill the word of God in terms of what I'm to be doing. But in all of that, the key thing is to teach people to speak faith. And so that particular thing that I read today just struck me. You know, I, I don't know. But let's talk about genuine Christianity. <laughs> Remember we said the word genuine is truly what something is said to be or it is authentic. And uh, we're going to pick up with some scripture here that uh, I just kind of barely mentioned last time. Um, let's look at Jude 1, 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of God ordained unto this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness. Now remember we said that the departure from the faith, so to speak, or sound teaching of the word, or genuine Christianity as I've been calling it, we trace back to this term lasciviousness. And it's a big, long, theological sounding word, but basically it just means being led and guided and directed by the flesh. Flesh emphasis, me emphasis. I want to fulfill my desires, and when I say my, I'm not talking about the spirit man. I'm talking about the flesh. I want to fulfill what I want. Well, those type of men who are teaching this are turning the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, that is, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I saw in this a kind of an answer to the question that I originally posed, which is why are people getting away from sound doctrine? We know that in these last days, perilous times will come. We know that in these last days, there will be people who are looking for teachers, having itching ears, wanting to hear what they want to hear. We know all that's coming. You know, we've been told that. We understand that. But what's the underlying cause? You know, why do you want to hear, I say you, talking about the body of Christ at large, why would one, maybe put it that way, want to hear certain things over other things, if the desire is to fulfill the flesh, the desires of the flesh. It's because they want to look for an excuse. They, you know, Brother Copeland always kidded about uh, having a license to sin. He said a lot of people come up to him and said, you're just giving people a license to sin. He said, I found out people will sin without a license. <laughs> you know, they don't need a license to sin. But Christians who are at least even somewhat serious about the Word of God, at least want an excuse. <laughs> they want to be able to say, well, now, you know, and come up with some justification of some kind to excuse their lifestyle and still be able to claim, now, I'm, a good, I'm in good standing with my church. I'm, you know, we're all good. Uh, I've even heard people say, you know, me and my maker have an understanding well, the understanding is whatever God said in his word is true. <laughs> the understanding is if you're going to live a godly life, you're going to have to live it God's way. He's not changing. You know, you can claim anything you want, but he's, he's not changing. Uh, it's like the little cartoon I saw of uh, a demon trying to get into heaven. And he's at the gate, and he's talking to St. Peter. And he says, I identify as an angel. And St. Peter says, we don't do any of that up here. <laughs> and I'm like, 
Yeah, that's, that's the thing. You don't turn to God and, and stick your, your finger in his face and say, now we have an understanding. No, no. The understanding is the word of God. The understanding is live a godly life. Don't try to get by with anything. Well, anyway, these people, it says, crept in to, let's look, look at it this way. They crept into our circles, unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. Well, that ought to tell you something right there. They're ungodly. They're not teaching the word of God. They're not teaching godly principles. And what are they doing? They're turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness. Now, that phrase, it really sums up what I'm seeing and what kind of prompted me into this study a little bit is people have taken the concept of grace, unmerited favor is one definition. There are many others. I like the way Pastor brings it out, talks about that grace is a power that empowers you to live a godly life and live according to the word. Um, and that's, that's a very in-depth teaching we could get into that would take a very long period of time. But the thing is, people look at grace and say, well, I live under grace, therefore I'm pre-forgiven. Or I live under grace, therefore God cuts me some slack. Or I don't know, whatever, however you want to look at it. The bottom line is, they are using that as an excuse for lasciviousness. Now, going back to what Brother Copeland was talking about, he began to teach in the 70s from the Word of God where it says that Jesus took our sin upon himself and became sin, and we got his righteousness, and that therefore, according to the Word of God, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what the guy was... was fussing at him about, about you're giving people a license to sin. Because their assumption was, if you tell people they're the righteous, righteousness of God, they're not going to aspire to righteousness. Therefore, they're going to go off and sin, you know, with no throttle. Look at it that way. Uh, and I understand that up to a point. But Brother Copeland's point was, the righteousness doesn't come from your works. The righteousness doesn't come from the fact that you're going to live right. You know, the world's view of getting into heaven is you live right and you do all these good things and you help little ladies across the street and one day all that good stuff's going to be counted and it's going to go on the board and you're going to make it. Well, that is not the way it works. We know that. I mean... Even growing up Southern Baptist, I knew that. That's just not the way it works. It is not of works lest any man should boast. So I understood that. But the thing is, the children of Israel, and this is something that Paul covered in Romans chapter 10 as well. Matter of fact, in the early part of the chapter, he said that his heart's de desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he carried that on to say, for they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, which is really the word epignosis, which is revelation knowledge. They don't have revelation knowledge of where righteousness truly comes from. They don't have revelation knowledge of the word of God concerning the fact that Jesus is the only way to God. And it's his righteousness that we stand in. So he went on to say that they, going about to establish their own righteousness, do not understand the, the revelation of the righteousness of God through Jesus, through Jesus Christ. So that's really the underlying part of all of this is people are thinking that if I've been made the righteousness of God, then therefore I'm going to sin because I can get away with it, you know. And, and that attitude is what these people were teaching. They turn, turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and by doing so, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they didn't deny what Jesus has done for us 
through making us the righteousness of God because of him bearing our sin. So, that lack of a knowledge, that, that misunderstanding of Scripture and of the principles of the Word of God is what lead people into this. And then the flesh takes over, and their personal carnal desires take over, and they're like, well, we can get away with this. And you're not going to get away with it. Now, I've heard people say, well, now, now, Dr. Bill, you know, now if you're born again, and you do sin, well, now, you know, God will forgive you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And yeah, I know First John 1, 9, I understand that, and I, I'm thankful for that. You know, praise the Lord. But, again, it's like they don't want to even attempt to live a holy life. Or they've been taught all their life you can't, and so they don't even give it a try. <laughs> you know, and the thing about it is, God does, it, the reason we should be living a holy life is not because it's going to get us into heaven, it's because it's pleasing to God. And as people who are of God, we should be wanting to please the Father. God is pleased by our faith, that's what impresses him, and he's pleased by us living a holy life as the righteousness of God here on the earth. We demonstrate what Jesus has done to us, to the world, as that old, you know, saying goes, sometimes we're the only Bible the world will ever read. They look at us, and if they see us wanting to sin, if they see us excusing sin, if they see us accepting sin, and that's one of the big issues that I have with a lot of, you know, Christians that are not well taught in the Word today, is they go along with the world's view of what's good or bad. They, they get to the point, and this is one thing that happens again in the last days that we know is coming and has come, is that they call evil good and good evil. That verse. And we see that. We see sin being called good. We see people standing up against sin as evil in the world system, the world at large. And so they look at us and say, all right, you people are judgmental. You people are, are, are not walking in love and all these kinds of things. And Christians buy into that, a lot of them. And so they just basically, I mean, what the world is telling us to do as Christians is sit down and shut up. <laughs> you know, don't bother me with all that church stuff. Don't bother me with all that walking holy stuff or whatever. Just sit down and shut up. Get out of my way. Let me sin. And the church is like, yeah, it sounds pretty good to me. I mean, you know, because they don't want to be confrontational. And I'm not saying we go out and march and burn stuff up and everything like the world does. That's the world's method. But we ought to be taking a stand, at least personally, in what is right and what is wrong. Uh, when I was working in the hospital system, uh, you know, you work with a lot of different people with a lot of different lifestyles and a lot of different backgrounds. And uh, there was a gentleman who worked in the system who was a homosexual. Well, he at first cuddled a broad path away from me. He didn't want to be around me because he'd heard I was a Christian and he heard I was a preacher. And he thought, oh, my goodness, you know, i got to stay away from this guy. Uh, but I never made any, you know, remarks or, or made him feel uncomfortable or whatever. He would come up, and he'd get to talking about something other, and I was polite. I never agreed with his lifestyle. I never told him good for you, you know, or any of that kind of stuff, which is what the world wants us to do. But I w just walked out the word in love. And he told me one time, and I really appreciated this, he said, you know, at first you made me uncomfortable. But I begin to see that you just believe this, and you're not condemning me. He said, but every time I'm around you, I will say this, I'm always thinking about it. And so I thought, in the back of my mind, I didn't say anything, but in the back of my mind, I thought, well, praise the Lord, that's really what needs to be happening. I'm preaching to him without words. 
I'm living a life that makes him go, what do I need to do about all of this? You know, and that's, I mean, I'm not his convictor. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not the one that's called to, you know, bash him over the head with the scriptures. He's heard enough, and he's heard me enough to know where I stand, and just being around him was a witness to him. And I've had that time and time again. I had a guy who very, worked very closely with me. He was in another group, this, this other guy. But this guy that I'm talking about now was in, in my group. And uh, he was a bit of a drinker, a <laughs> bit of a hay raker, you know, as my dad used to call it. And uh, a little loose with cussing. But he'd get around me and he'd quit cussing. And uh, finally he said, he told me one day, he says, he let something slip. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, what? He said, I didn't mean to cuss around you. Uh, I said, and he appreciated this. I said, eh, it's not going to cramp my lifestyle. <laughs> and he went, really? I said, no, I don't curse. I don't approve of it. I don't think it's necessary. But I'm not going to condemn you over it. Well, that just changed his whole countenance. I mean... He, really? <laughs> and we started, I started there in uh, 2007, I believe it was. And 10 years later, by the time I left, he'd gotten born again. He started going to church regularly. He quit drinking. <laughs> Turned around completely. And took on the approach of us and them <laughs> in, in what he was saying. You know, yeah, we got to stand up for God, you know. <laughs> and I couldn't help but grin kind of internally about it because I thought, that's not where you were before. <laughs> but, again, I never preached him a sermon. Now, he started watching the program because he was curious. And he heard me preach. But I never sat him down and started berating him or anything like that. But he ends up, over time, receiving the Lord through that whole process by simply being a witness to him. So, as we are out in the world, and we have friends that are in all kind of, kind of different places, we've got family that are in all kinds of different places, as we're out among them, we have opportunity to share what we know and what the Word of God says in a gentle, loving, kind way that will minister to them. And that's really what we're here for. If we were just here to get bored again, and then we could check out on the next wave, you know, and go to heaven, uh, why even, why, why do we need to be here? But we're here for the mission God's called us to do. And a lot of us, he's given special instructions to, like ministry. Others of us, he's called us to just be a witness where we are and what we do. Uh, and even retired, you know, uh, I'm talking to people in the store, talking to people at the restaurant, talking to people, all kinds of different places. We have opportunity. My neighbors, bless their hearts. Man, they're a weird bunch. <laughs> I've got a, I got a squirrely bunch of neighbors. A lot of them little old ladies who are just very strange people. But I'll talk to them, and we'll get to talking about it. And there's this one lady that lives right next door to me negative oh my goodness she can't say anything without it being negative and i don't care what the topic is she'll find something negative to say about it and uh complains about all kinds of different things and i won't agree with her but i'll i'll just always throw in the positive side you know she'll start talking about uh uh well even the weather she'll start talking oh man it's really hot i said well that's true that's true uh but it's a pretty day isn't it <laughs> I just always bring it back to something positive. And I've noticed over time she's gone from looking so sour and drawn to being a little more chipper, you know, a little brighter. And so I'm working on her. <laughs> and I try to do little things here and there, you know, to help her out. She, she doesn't walk very well. She uses a walker kind of like I do, but... She has to drag one of her legs because her, her knee doesn't work very well, so she kind of drags it. And she has problems picking up things and so forth. So I try to help her 
where I can. Belinda does as well. And, uh, you know, it's just interesting to see the transformation that begins to take place. Her son comes by and checks on her. And he'll end up doing things for us to help us out. We got a delivery one day that involved a big old giant box. It was that uh, fireplace that y'all helped us with. <laughs> big thing in a giant box. And it was on a pallet. And so we drug that thing in the door, drug that thing in the door, finally got it off the pallet, got it inside. And the pallet, I didn't know what to do with it, so I put it under the stairs there in front of the condo. And I thought, now, I know the neighbors, they're going to fuss if I don't get that thing out of here. So I was trying to drag it to my van. And, of course, you know, I'm not, <laughs> it was a big, heavy oak pallet, so I wasn't exactly flipping it around, you know, like a muscle man. So I'm dragging that thing. And her son comes out, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He grabs the thing up and says, what do you want to do with this? I said, I was going to put it back in the van and carry it off and throw it away. Oh, let me take care of it. So he picks it up and walks all the way over to the trash receptacle, puts it all in there, has to break it up, put it, I watched him do this whole thing. And he comes back, and I said, man, I really appreciate that. Oh, we're glad to help. And he went on back into, you know, his mother's condo. And I thought, boy, that was a blessing. And it was just, I don't know, it just was a really uh, illustrative situation of how that whole situation and family and that dynamic has changed just that much for the better to the point that now they're looking at it helping us and doing things for us. So it's just, it's just a blessing to walk out what I call again here genuine Christianity walking it out, being loving, being kind, being helpful, uh, sharing where you can, but not being, it's easy to be distracted by the negatives you see. You know, I talk about some of the stuff I see on Facebook and some of these doctrines. I have this whole list of, of crazy doctrines, like that one guy saying, you know, that um, the word of faith was you know, overemphasizing words. Uh, we've already talked about tithing isn't for today. Personal holiness isn't necessary. Church in attendance is not required. Uh, uh, here's one that was, it's kind of a hot button for me too. It's not necessary to believe in the resurrection of Jesus to be saved. What? It says it right there in Romans chapter 10. Verses 8, 9, and 10. You've got to believe, you got to confess Jesus as Lord, believe God raised him from the dead. That's a requirement <laughs> to be saved. Anyway, blaming God when it's the devil's work. You know, the insurance companies talking about acts of God, all that kind of stuff. These are all just doctrines. Being pre-forgiven, we've talked about that. Uh, the I am right mentality. Not seeing blessings as mercies of God, it is something you are owed. I've seen a lot of people that act like God is this great big you know, machine in the sky that you put your coins into and out comes the blessing. Or even, even worse, the people that say, if you uh, touch the corners of this photograph that I've posted, you'll be blessed today. Yeah. I tell you, that one, that kind of stuff gets me because that's Bible witchcraft. That is witchcraft. That has nothing to do with God. And here they are thinking they're being hot. Big shot Christians got to bless everybody by posting this thing and just showing their ignorance. But anyway, it's going to be nice. First uh, <laughs> uh, John 1 9 shouldn't be in the Bible. That's another one from my, our buddy that uh, doesn't believe in the word of faith. <laughs> he says, First John 1 9 shouldn't be in the Bible because we're forgiven and we live by grace. There's no need for me to confess sin because I can't sin anyway. Sure. <laughs> this like, reminds me of the pastor that told me he'd, learned, he'd finally figured it out how not to sin. He, di he didn't sin anymore. I said, so you don't sin? He said, yeah, that's right. I said, what about pride? <laughs> he batted his eye and looked at me. What, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you say you can't sin. Seems like you're operating in pride. That's a sin. He went, oh. <laughs> Oh, man, I tell you, this pastor did that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> accepting the world's teaching is doctrine. 
which is being conformed to the world. Romans chapter 12, of course, talking about there, not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind of the Word of God. Jesus is the only way to God. There are not many ways. Another doctrine. Any doctrine that, that preaches or condones division and strife, our way is the only way. Bless God, you're not with us, you're against God. There is only one way to God, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ, but there's a whole lot of doctrines out there. And the fact that you want everybody to agree with your doctrine, that does, that does not make you right, it does not make it good. There's a lot of people going to still believe things that, you know, I could take the scripture and run through all the verses and show that that is a completely squirrely doctrine, but if they believe Jesus is Lord, confess to him as Lord, believe God raised him from the dead, and they're born again, bless God there's hope for them. <laughs> you know, I believe the Holy Ghost can get a hold of them and teach them the word. There's no reason for me to, to just cut them off. You know, I don't have to be, I don't have to listen to their doctrine. Uh, you know, you don't go to a meeting where you know somebody's teaching something that's wrong just because you're going to fellowship with them and be a Christian. Oh, well, we're all Christians together. No, you don't have to listen to that and, and do that. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, I guess what I'm trying to say here. Otherwise, you can't reach him with the word. You can't reach him with sound doctrine. Um, everywhere Paul went, now Paul even, when he was preaching, he went to a particular city, and they had statues up to all these different gods. And they even had a statue up to the unknown god. And rather than just throwing a hissy fit and saying, you bunch of knuckleheads, you don't know what you believe. Look at all these statues. He didn't take that approach. He took the approach of, uh, brethren, I've come to you today to tell you about the unknown god that you've got a statue to up here. And that got their attention. It made them want to listen. To what, oh, really? What are you talking about? And so then he shared the gospel with them. He had an inroad because he didn't immediately shun them. Now, if somebody, the Word of God does tell us that if somebody comes into your church and teaches false doctrine and stirs up a hornet's nest on purpose, like that talked about, you know, those who are ordained unto condemnation, ungodly men that turn the grace of our Lord unto uh, unrighteousness or lasciviousness, um, it, the Word of God does say that we can shun them that we can turn from them, that we can put them out of the church, that falls into the category of church discipline, which again is another long teaching that we would have to get into. And we won't do that because it's not our purpose here tonight. But church discipline requires that the pastor correct things. And praise the Lord, we've had Pastor Ed tell us some things and correct things from the pulpit <clears throat> because of doctrines that have been taught within the church, people pulling people aside and, trying to pigeonhole them and say, yeah, now this is the way it is. Pastor Ed's wrong. I mean, you know, it's interesting, through all the years that I've been here at this church, nobody's ever pulled me aside and tried to tell me some squirrely doctrine. Now, you know, I pondered that one day. I mean, I thought, is it that they don't like me? <laughs> they don't want to share their squirrely doctrine with me? And then I realized, no, it's just that they know that as soon as they say, Pastor Ed's wrong, and I'm going to show you this doctrine that I'd be going, no, now hold on here. <laughs> and be setting them put down and telling them what the Word of God says, and so they don't want to talk to me. They're just going, well, we'll let him go. You know? So I, I got to thinking, well, I don't want to take it as a slight. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> that's the way I'll look at it. You know, again, that's that positive side again. So the thing about it is, Anytime you've got somebody surreptitiously going around in the background trying to do something secretively, come to our meeting, we'll straighten you out. That's immediately suspicious. I mean, why in the world, if, if you've got some great new doctrine, share it with the pastor. Let him judge it and, and, and show him scriptures and let him make the decision of, of whether or not you get to teach in the, in the church or whatever. And uh, he's, he's the one that's charged with the responsibility of keeping the doctrine straight. So I lean to that anointing. You know, praise the Lord. Let, let, him, let him make those decisions. That's the way it should be. And, uh, you know, if they're so hot to found their own little church, they can go off and start their church. 
but don't take our folk with you. <laughs> Go get your own folks. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. But the thing about it is, all of this is stuff we're facing in this world today. All of this is stuff we're having to deal with because, again, I believe we're in the last of the last days. And so it's, it's good for us to take a moment like this and just stop and look at some of these issues and some of this background to be aware. And I think that awareness is what is going to be protective for us. That and exposure to the true Word of God and receiving from the Word of God and reading the Word of God for yourself. I like what I heard Keith Moore say one time. He said you need to be reading the Word of God every day. And he said by that I mean put your eyes on it. <laughs> and I like that phrase, put your eyes on it. Because it's easy to say, well, I listen to tapes. I listen to this and... And very often you do that while you're doing something else and you're distracted. You're not concentrating on it. It's one thing to listen to audio Bible. I listen to that myself. But I like to do that while I'm following along and reading it because it engages me. It, it, it makes me tie in to whatever's being delivered from the Scriptures. And... Very often, it'll prompt me to go off and study something else and prompt me over to study something else. And before I know it, several hours have gone by. I've been just doing all kinds of studies. And that's fun. I enjoy that. So we ought to be doing that. We ought to be taking time to put our eyes on it, take our time to study some things out. And then we won't be so easily distracted and pulled away from, from things. So that's pretty much what I wanted to share about genuine Christianity that we're the ones that determine what we listen to, what we watch, what we take in. And that determines what we live out and how we live out the life that God has for us. Praise the Lord. Well, I hope you got something out of this, this little quick diversion study we've had. Uh, I know Pastor will be back Sunday, and as far as I know, Wednesday for after that and so forth, but... Uh, it's been, it's been fun to get to come and, and share the word with you.